Good morning, good afternoon, and good, e good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Kubernetes Masterclass for this Tuesday, August 20th, 2019. Uh, today, we're going to talk about disaster recovery strategies for Kubernetes. My name is Jason Van Brackle. I'm the Director of Community here at Rancher Labs. Uh, my GitHub, Slack, and Twitter are there available. With me today is M Michael Ferranti, the VP of Product Marketing at Portworks. Michael, are you with me? I, I am. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Awesome. Thank you for being here. So, today's master class. We're going to try to keep this between 40 and 45 minutes, but your questions are welcome. Use the questions tab uh, in your, you know, in your uh, go to webinar. Uh, we'll, I may respond at, you know, as Michael's talking, or we can hold them till after his presentation. Uh, we'll try to answer all the questions, uh, but also try to respect your time as needed. Also, if you have to jump off, this session is being recorded. Uh, U2.com slash C slash Rancher. It will be up later. And if you want to join the conversation or have questions afterwards, get to trying this out. Uh, we are also available on Slack. Uh, Slack.rancher.io. Put in your email address and you can join us in the Masterclass channel. I'll be monitoring that channel while Michael's presenting. With that, I'm going to hand over control to Michael and I'll let him get started. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen with everybody. And I'm going to go into presenter mode and let's go ahead and get started. Um, if for any reason uh, the slides are, advanced, are, are not advancing, just give me a shout out. Um, okay, so uh, topic today, disaster recovery strategies for Kubernetes. Um, a lot to cover uh, in this topic. Um, and I, I, you know, I think most of the people on the call um, have been doing Kubernetes for a while now. Uh, you know, uh, a little bit of the shine is off of Kubernetes in the sense that, you know, we've got, you know, you know, two years under our belts, 18 months, 12 months, six months. These are really common time periods for people to have been, um, have been using Kubernetes to uh, run and deploy applications. Um, and you know, we as we adopt any new technology, um, we kind of start easy and we get complex uh, from there. Meaning, we don't try to do everything at once. You know, every application um, isn't going on Kubernetes day one. We're kind of picking and choosing, picking you know, low hanging fruit, as we say. And as we get more experience with Kubernetes and start to see the benefits of running applications on Kubernetes, inevitably we ask the question, you know, what next? Um, oftentimes. The what next is really a function of business requirements. It's not so much technical requirements as, as it is business requirements. And a lot of applications in the enterprise have business requirements around disaster recovery. You know, I need to be able to, I need to be able to recover from a total data center outage of this application within you know four hours or two hours or one hour. And so our topic today, it's a little bit of an advanced topic within Kubernetes because it's you know it's not the day one type operations um, that we're that we've got some experience with it's 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 some newer concepts and so i'm going to talk about what are the characteristics of of a dr solution for kubernetes um and then i'm going to show you a demo of of that in action um to to kind of illustrate some of those um some of those capabilities um you know i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about myself um i think the the, the thing that's relevant for this conversation is i've been um, you know, in the Kubernetes, or excuse me, in the container ecosystem uh, for over five years now. Um, in fact, um, not only in the container ecosystem, but in the container storage and data management ecosystem. Um, uh, my company before last uh, made an open source project uh, for, for managing state within Docker containers. Uh, we started that project before Kubernetes itself uh, was publicly announced from Google. Um, so I've seen the evolution of kind of the industry saying, you know, well, we don't need to talk about disaster recovery because we're not going to run stateful services like databases and containers all the way to, you know, uh, uh, keynotes and, you know, uh, tech talks and case studies at KubeCon talking about really large, sophisticated organizations doing just that. And so that's really cool to see that evolution. And, you know, my, I, I'm really passionate about distributed systems, um, kind of building, um, uh, you know, SaaS applications and cloud applications and, and you know, have, have worked on teams doing that at a number of different companies. So a, a lot of what I'm telling you today is based on, you know, the experience that, that I've gained over the last five years on figuring out with customers what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about 
um, uh, this slide, the, the main thing that I want um, uh, this to underscore is that, you know, at Portworks, um, we work with a large variety of customers, many of them large scale enterprises. And, you know, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is pulled from the experience working with those customers. So as a, as a practitioner, you're kind of faced with, you know, I, I hear about a new technology and it sounds great, but, you know, is it reliable? Is it ready for production? And, you know, I just want to assuage everybody that all the things that I'm talking about here um, have been tested in production with customers. So you can kind of feel confident that, you know, if I experiment with some of these technologies and some of these techniques that, you know, I'm not the first one to do it. Um, you know, every situation is different, every environment's different, but, you know, at, at least you're in good company with with some of the um, uh, customers like the ones you've seen here that, that Portworx works with on a daily basis. Um, okay, so, you know, now I want to talk about context. Why are, why are we talking about this? I, you know, I've, I've given you one view of it, which is to say, well, you know, we want to run more apps on Kubernetes. How do we do that? Well, we have to handle these business requirements like disaster recovery, like data security in order to be able to confidently run those apps on Kubernetes. Um, another lens into that is um, this, uh, this white paper that came out from 451 Research. Um, I saw it last week, it might be two weeks old, very, very new. Um, and they did a survey recently of the enterprise about uh, storage and workloads in 2019. And, kind of a couple of data points that just underscored the importance of our topic here today. You know, lots of ways to slice and dice this. At the end of the day, what they found is that 40%, 48%, excuse me, of enterprises running mission critical ap applications demand an RTO of less than an hour. RTO is recovery time objective. That means from the time of a disaster until when that application is able to serve traffic again, I can have at most one hour of downtime. 48% of enterprises running mission critical applications have an RTO of less than an hour. And you can see um, as, as kind of I talk that, you know, some enterprises say, you know, we need less than a minute. You know, we need, you know, less than an hour. And that could be less than an hour. That could be five minutes. Uh, it could be, you know, in all cases, no more than 59 minutes. Um, 57 demand an RPO of less than an hour. RPO is recovery point objective. This is how much data am I willing to lose and still have my application um, come back up within my recovery time objective. Um, so if I have an RPO requirement of zero, zero data loss, uh, that indicates that I'm gonna have to have a different disaster recovery architecture than if say I have an RPO of 15 minutes or one hour or four hours. I can have different um, architectures and the architecture that I pick is gonna be a function of my data center um, and network topology and my business requirements. Um, at the end of the day though, you have to pick for disaster recovery, you have to pick an RPO and you have to pick an RTO. And then how you manage it is a function of, again, those business requirements and your network architecture. Um, okay, so let, let me start by saying DR for containers is simply different than DR for VMs. And the rest of my slide presentation is gonna talk specifically about these points. Um, and then I'm gonna show you a demo that, that, uh, that pulls it all together. Um, you know, RPO, RTO, disaster recovery, th these concepts have been around for, you know, as long as there have been applications. And many of you have likely worked on DR projects um, at your companies. Um, some of these projects, you know, they're multi-million dollar projects. They, you know, they take 18 months to complete. Um, and at the end of the day, they're completed, we move on. Um, so, you know, what more is there to say about DR other than pick an RPO, pick an RTO, pick an architecture and deploy it? Well, for Kubernetes, a lot changes from the way applications were built and run from a DR perspective on VMs. And these changes can be subtle, but they can also be profound. And unless you take containerized systems as they are, an architect using the, um, the abstractions that containers provide, um, your disaster recovery program for containerized applications is, is really going to be messy. Um, your RTOs are going to suffer. Uh, your RPOs probably will suffer. There's going to be a lot of manual intervention. Um, and all of that is what we're trying to avoid with Kubernetes, where Kubernetes is a system to manage other systems, 
and to do it automatically. So you don't have a human involved in every operational decision. Why? Because the number of applications we're running is increasing. Uh, the uh, availability requirements of those applications are increasing. We need that automation. And unless you pick a DR uh, solution or you architect your, your DR solution in a way that respects these differences in containers and VMs, it's going to be really hard to achieve those goals. So I want to talk about each of these in turn. Um, and then again, I'll, I'll show a demo of it all coming together um, uh, on Rancher Kubernetes Engine. Um, so the first thing about DR for containers is it needs to be container granular. Um, you know, uh, uh, congratulations on that. You know, uh, that's the obvious statement of the year. Um, but it's really important to understand, and, and I think a lot of times gets missed when people say, oh, I already have a DR solution for my OpenStack environment or for my VMware environment. I'm just going to use that. Um, you know, we're not talking about cloud native storage today per se, uh, but the same the same thing uh, gets said when, you know, you say, hey, I want to run Cassandra on containers. I know I need a persistent storage solution. You know, I've already got a, um, a, a, a storage solution in my data center that I'm using for my vSphere environment. I'm just going to use that. That that misses the point that containers are different and you need technologies that speak the container language that are, are fluent in the container abstractions. And at the most fundamental level, this means that we can't use machine-based backups in order to do DR for containers because there's an impedance mis mismatch between those two. So to illustrate that, you know, I've, I've got a you know a very simplified Kubernetes cluster with four applications. One application is a three node Cassandra ring. So this is one application, but Cassandra is a distributed database. So it's running across three different servers. And I have three individual MySQL databases, each serving their own application. So the, the very simple question to ask is, how do I back up only the application in question? How do I back up that Cassandra or one of those MySQL databases? Um, if we use a machine-based approach, we realize that there, there's immediately there's an impedance mismatch. So if I want to back up node one, or excuse me, if I want to back up my MySQL database that's running on node one, well, one way I could do it is back up node one. That works, but now I have a bunch of Cassandra data also in my backup that I'm going to have to get rid of in order to um, bring my application back up. You know, there's a cost associated with um, uh, with transferring data between environments. And so, you know, let's say that that Cassandra volume is, you know, a, a terabyte or 500 gigabytes, and I'm trying to back up my MySQL uh, data, which is, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, 100 gigabytes, you know, backing them up together doesn't really make sense. And in, in any case, even if bandwidth is not an issue, I'm going to have to do an ETL procedure in order to bootstrap my cluster with just the MySQL data. Um, okay, well, what about Cassandra? Um, it's, excuse me. And so what I want to do is I want to be able to back up just the MySQL volume itself. Um, so we asked the question, what about Cassandra? Well, I can back up all three of my nodes because some portion of my data is running on each of those nodes. Well, again, this is just the same case we talked um, about before, except it's even worse because now I'm backing up three different MySQL databases that I don't need in order to back up my Cassandra ring. What I want to be able to do, again, is back up those individual Cassandra volumes alone. Um, so that's container granularity. Um, so keep all of that in your head and say, I also need that 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 container granularity to be Kubernetes namespace aware. Um, in other words, my DR solution needs to speak the language of Kubernetes. What do I mean by that? Well, I showed you a simple, uh, an overly simplified Kubernetes cluster. Let's look at another slightly oversimplified uh, Kubernetes cluster, but that now adds the complexity that all of these applications are running in two different namespaces. So you might think with this architecture that I've got namespace one that, that's neatly on the first four uh, servers here. These could be uh, uh, cloud instances. They could be bare metal servers running in your own, um, your own data center. And then namespace two is running on these four. Uh, but that's not the way Kubernetes works. Um, each of these namespaces and the pods that make up each of these applications is, is multiplexed. And, 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 and mixed up on these eight underlying hosts. And so in order to be able to have that container granularity, 
um, without having to go in and, and do a backup operation for each individual pod, I need my DR solution for Kubernetes to speak namespace, to understand what is a namespace and how do I um, uh, perform backup operations on namespace one or namespace two in a way that's container granular, in a way that allows me to pull my Kafka data out, even though it's distributed across five different servers, um, pull out my InfluxDB data, pull out my Elasticsearch data, ignore my MySQL data, right? If I'm just backing up namespace two, I need to be able to do that uh, because with a single command now, I can capture my entire application, not simply a, an individual collection of pods. And you can think about, you know, if you have hundreds of these applications running in a Kubernetes cluster, um, how complex it would be to think about having to go and do these operations at the individual container level, container one, then container two, then container three. We still need the container granularity, but we want to be able to um, uh, administer it at a namespace level. Okay. So I've just talked about container granularity. We've talked about adding in this, this notion of namespace aware. Now let's talk about application consistency. Um, distributed systems require application consistency, not just um, a crash consistency. Um, so going back to our, um, our, our, our simplified Kubernetes cluster before, um, Okay, I want to back up my Cassandra database. We've talked about, you know, I, I don't want to just back up the all three of these nodes because then I'm going to have to get rid of all my MySQL data. I want to focus in on the individual uh, Cassandra volumes. But what I don't mean is, okay, snapshot these individual Cassandra volumes and problem solved. No, Cassandra is a distributed system. So even though these these uh, uh, Cassandra pods are running across different hosts, uh, they still function as a single system. And so when I take my backup, I need to make sure that my Cassandra database, which is made up of multiple uh, pods, is going to be recovered with its backup data. Um, and if I snapshot these serially, I'm going to end up with data corruption. Um, if I snapshot them at what I think is the same machine time, I may still end up with, with data corruption if it's an active database. I need tooling that allows me to take an application consistent view of, of of Cassandra even across multiple hosts um, and I need to be able to do the same thing uh, even for MySQL um, because even though let's say this is a, this is not kind of a three um, node MySQL uh, database but it's a single instance of, of MySQL um, even then the, um, you could have some some rights that have been um, uh, you know acknowledged by the application but that haven't been flushed to disk and you want to make sure that those are captured before you snapshot your your database otherwise you might end up with some um, uh, some corruption that could prevent your application from restarting in the event of a disaster um, the impact of that being an increased RTO or recovery time objective so we need to understand at an application level how MySQL likes to be backed up how Cassandra likes to be backed up, how Kafka, how Elasticsearch, how name your database likes to be backed up. And in order to do that, you need technology that allows you to understand the a process of taking an application consistent backup. And I'm not going to go through in detail, but that's different for MySQL. It's different for Cassandra. It's different for Kafka. Um, but we have to think about these things at a, um, um, at a systems level in order to be to build a system that's administratable um, at scale with our on our Kubernetes platform. Um, okay, so for the most part, everything that I've said to this point has been about backing up data. And and clearly, when we're talking about data services like databases or search applications or machine learning or big data, you know, the data is is an important part of it, and we we commonly call that state. Uh, but there's more state within a Kubernetes application than just data. And a DR system built for containers needs to back up not just data, you need to back up application configuration as well. Just the data is not enough, and neither is just the application configuration. Um, this is kind of an oversimplified left side, right side to show you what I mean by the difference. So if you say, okay, an application running on Kubernetes is, is made up of three things. Um, if it's a stateful service, there's some, there's some data, there's a volume, uh, there's clearly a, a container image, 
Um, and then there's application configuration. These are Kubernetes objects like PVs and PVCs and controllers and service accounts. There are dozens of these um, uh, configuration files um, uh, using YAML that make up our Kubernetes application. And if I want to back up that app, I need to capture all of this. I need to know which container image version to run. I need to have the data and I need the application configuration. A, a lot of traditional DR solutions are going to focus on the crash consistent snapshot of that volume. We've already seen in which ways that is insufficient when now our application is split up amongst multiple hosts um, and no one host either has all the data or has only the data you're looking at. So clearly that's um, insufficient. But even if, we, even if we solve that, even if we get the first three um, uh, uh, capabilities that we're talking about, container granularity, namespace awareness, application consistency, unless we back up the app config along with the data, our RTOs are gonna suffer. It's gonna be harder to spin up that application in the new environment. And especially when we're talking about large Kubernetes clusters with dozens or hundreds of applications, having to bring back online um, uh, you know, dozens of, of Kubernetes applications and rebuild that app config in, in, in place in order to spin up an application using a particular volume uh, is very, very time consuming. Exactly the kind of thing we want to avoid when we invest in an automation platform like Kubernetes. And so we need to be able to back up the entire application data and application configuration. And finally, we need to make sure that this DR solution is optimized for a multi-cloud world. Um, you know, speaking from uh, personal experience, you know, the customers that I'm working with, um, you know, I don't know of any of them who exclusively run in one environment anymore. At, at minimum, they run in multiple data centers on-prem or in the cloud. You know, we're an Amazon shop, but we run in multiple Amazon regions. You know, we, we, we are all on-prem, but we have multiple on-premise data centers. And so when they start to talk about Kubernetes and DR, it's about, you know, we want to have this be our primary site, and we want this to be our, our, uh, our backup site. Very, very common, different data centers. Uh, but then increasingly we have, you know, people who are on, you know, Azure and Google or Amazon and Azure, on-prem and, and Google, any combination thereof. And based on their business requirements, based on the RPOs and the RTOs that they're trying to, uh, to deal with, they can mix and match their infrastructure in order to be able to provide uh, the capabilities that satisfy their business requirements. Meaning, you know, I can, I can get zero RPO um, uh, DR for data centers, in, on-prem on data centers, all within, you know, uh, clustered around my headquarters in, in Minneapolis. We have, we have three Equinix data centers right around HQ. And, you know, I want zero RPO within that environment because it's very low latency. Or, you know, I need a backup from uh, uh, AWS East to AWS West. Um, you know, I, I can't move data fast enough to get RPO zero, but, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with RPO one hour for this particular application. You need to think about how your business requirements, your network topology come together in order to build the right DR strategy. And a couple of examples of this from kind of our own customers would be, you know, a, a customer that requires RPO zero, so zero data loss disaster recovery, where they've got two data centers in what we call a campus or a metro area. Uh, so, for instance, this could be a on-prem data center direct connected into an Amazon data center. Um, so that's very low latency. Uh, it could be, you know, Azure to Amazon, both in, um, say, Northern Virginia. Uh, you know, two data centers in Frankfurt. It, it what it's not the providers or the, the on-prem or cloud that matters. It's what is the the round trip latency between those environments. And and typically, we wouldn't recommend this for anything over 10 millisecond round trip latency. But so I've got I've got these two data centers. They're pretty close together. I'm going to have an active Kubernetes cluster in one environment that's serving my traffic. I'm going to have a DR site in some other data center that I'm going to be able to fail over to. And I want to make sure that every write to my active site is synchronously replicated to the standby site. And I want to make sure all of my objects are also replicated to the standby site. So the first time that are deployed or any time they're updated. 
Um, what that enables is in the case of a data center failure, I can fail over to that DR site. All of my data is already there because of, of synchronous replication that we can do thanks to that low latency. And all of my Kubernetes objects are there giving me a very low RTO, you know, on the order in the, in the demo that I'm going to show you, uh, you know, on the order of, you know, a minute, five minutes, very, very reasonable to achieve. If we take containers as they are and say, I understand what a namespace is. I understand container granularity. I understand application consistency. And I'm, um, uh, I, I understand that I need to back up data and application configuration. And I want to do that in a low latency uh, data center topology. Like, when I say it like that, it's actually really easy to understand and um, uh, in, not understand. It's easy to envision how what se seems inherently complex, DR, you know, we just spent $3 million last year um, and, you know, 18 months in order to do DR at my bank. You know, th these are types of things that I hear. When you say it like that, those five requirements are sufficient in order to have an automated DR uh, process. It's actually, it makes it a lot more approachable. And, you know, my hope is that a lot more applications will be able to run in Kubernetes um, uh, because of that. Um, so this is kind of a, a low latency network topology approach. Um, we can do the same thing over, um, uh, over a wide area network. Um, and I apologize for the um, that errant logo. Um, my account was hacked. Um, and, um, but you can think about this, excuse me, as, you know, rancher clusters in two different regions. Um, same thing, all of my application configuration is being moved between those environments, um, and I'm taking snapshots of my data and moving it regularly. Um, this is actually the demo that I'm gonna show you now, but it's, it's the same idea. It's the only difference is my RPO is gonna be different. So if I, if I need to have a DR site between um, uh, East Coast and West Coast, I'm not going to be able to use synchronous replication. It's not that it won't work. It's just your application performance is going to be terrible as your, your database is essentially locked until the data is replicated uh, 3,000 miles away. Not realistic. But if I have that requirement for geographic dispersity of, uh, uh, dispersion of my data, then and I'm okay accepting a five-minute or a 15-minute or one-hour RPO, I can send all my data as a snapshot. I can send all my application configuration as a snapshot. Once it's there, the impact is on RPO. How, how much data loss am I willing as, as writes come into my primary site but not are not yet snapshotted over to the DR site? That's where the impact of this, this um, uh, architecture is going to come in. But from an RTO perspective, how long it takes my application to recover, I'm going to get a very, very low level of RPO in the demo that, that I'm about to show you. you know, I, think, I think in this demo, it's about a minute. It's a very simplistic application. You know, if it's a more complex application, we could be talking about five minutes. It really depends on how long your pods take to come up, uh, but all your data is already there, all your app configuration there, and it's a very elegant um, uh, solution to the types of problems that we've just looked at. Um, okay, so let's actually do a demo of multi-cloud disaster recovery on RKE. Um, so I'm just gonna go full screen here. And um, I'm going to talk through this. I wanted to minimize kind of, you know, something happens with the networking on, on, on Amazon and I'm not able to connect to my cluster to really be able to hone in on the, um, uh, the, the, the primitives that we just talked about in terms of, you know, data, data backup using snapshots and application configuration and, and all of those concepts. I um, mean, this is very easy to try yourself if, if, if you so desire, you know, reach out to us and we're, we're happy to help you. Um, Okay, so, so here we go. Um, what I'm gonna show you is basically that wide area network disaster recovery, where I have an active site running a number of applications. I have a DR site that I wanna use in, in, case of a, uh, in case I need to fail over. And then I'm going to regularly snapshot both my data and my application configuration between those environments. I'm gonna tear down my active site to simulate a failure. And I'm gonna show you how the application is able to be up and running um, uh, again in the, uh, in, the, in the recovery site. So what I'm showing you here is we've got two clusters, a primary and, and a DR site, both running on RKE. Um, I have port works installed in, in both of those environments. Um, 
and as well as a Kubernetes cluster. So if I exec into the Portworx container, so Portworx itself runs as a container, so um, I, I can exec into that container. I can see that across those six nodes, I have 600 gigabytes of total capacity. I've got one volume, that's the, that's the data volume that we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be backing up. Uh, and you know, I can see that I don't have any apps running in the um, in the, the DR site. Uh, that is to be expected because it's my DR site. I, my my app is running in my primary site, um, and all of my traffic is being directed to that primary site. Um, it's called primary cluster here. And if I go to the uh, the URL of that application, I can I can see the application in action. It's it's simply it's a stupid kind of demo app. I click the screen, it adds some Kubernetes logos that records the coordinates for the position in a database. Okay, this is how we're gonna see that, you know, I can, I can um, uh, delete my database and still be able to recover. Okay, so in order to make all of this work together, I first need to pair my, clus my clusters together. I need to basically authenticate one cluster to another in these separate data centers. Uh, the way you do that is with a cluster pair. Um, that's a that's a Portworx concept that just pairs these clusters together so that I can move data back and forth and Kubernetes objects back and forth. Um, I've done that already um, so that I can zoom in on the actual migration itself. So here I have a YAML file that defines what I want to move and my policy. So um, I'm saying include resources here. Uh, include resources. Hold on, let me just uh, pause for a second. Um, include resources is those Kubernetes objects. So I could theoretically just move the data, but as we just talked about, you wouldn't wanna do that because then you would have to recreate your application uh, in place, which for our demo application is fairly trivial because there's not a whole lot of app config, but what if I lost 100 applications that are running on my Kubernetes cluster and I need to fail over them all? You would not wanna go in and do that manually. So you have the option to include resources, which is gonna mean that not only are we gonna move our data, periodically based on a schedule, but we're also gonna move our application configuration. Uh, and you can see that I also, um, uh, no, that's an, actually in the next step, excuse me. So now I'm going to uh, apply that migration using kubectl. Um, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna start regularly snapshotting my application and my application configuration and moving it to the secondary environment. Um, I set this one up to be one minute increments. So every minute, there's gonna be a snapshot of my data and a snapshot of my, um, uh, my Kubernetes resources, and it's gonna be pushed to the, uh, to the DR site. So as I kind of, as I watch both of these environments, um, I'm gonna see that, first of all, my migration is happening. I can see that I'm already on the stage of applications. I've already moved the data, now I'm moving application configuration. I can see how long it took. And now I can see my, my app and my, my database are coming up in my DR site. And remember before we didn't have um, any applications running in that site. Um, now we do, ta-da, as they say, uh, my application has been moved over. Now, again, this is trivial. This is a single application with a single volume, a single database. Think about what that means if you have hundreds of these things that I can set up a migration it could be namespace aware. I can constantly be moving all my apps and all my data between namespace one in my primary site to namespace two in my DR site. It's really hard to imagine how you would do that as easily um, uh, in, in, in some other way, in, in, in a way that didn't require a lot of manual intervention. Um, so now I just had a script that is gonna tear down my, my, uh, my active site. Um, in my app, as you can see, is going to fail over to the to um, to the uh, to the backup site, and you can see that my root 53 in Amazon is showing that my my primary cluster is, is unhealthy. Now my failover cluster is healthy. That's because the application is is running there. Now let me pause here. Um, I, I was talking through the earlier part of the demo, so uh, you might have missed it. That we we actually clicked and added some more logos to uh, to the screen. Um, so it was, it was these four that were added. Remember, this is the wide area network um, uh, configuration. So what, what that means is I've got an Amazon data center on the West Coast and an Amazon data center on the East Coast. I'm gonna back up my data and my application configuration between those environments. Um, I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna do that with snapshots. 
that are application consistent. Um, but you know, I, can, I can't snapshot every second. Right, it, it would, that wouldn't make sense. There, there. If if you have that level of granularity, let's pick a different arch network architecture um, using synchronous replication. For snapshots, I've said, okay, back it up every minute. What that means is that I'm willing to accept at most one minute of data loss in the in the event of a disaster. So when the app was still running in my primary site, it added some more data to my database. Then we killed the primary site. Then we recovered to the backup site using my snapshot backup and using the backup of my application configuration. So that, that's where we are at this point in the demo. Now, if I refresh this page, we're gonna see that the data, those last four now went away. Why did that happen? Well, that happened because I said, I'm gonna snapshot every minute. And we added that, um, that data after the, the, the latest snapshot and before a subsequent snapshot. That's, that, that's a system uh, decision. I mean, you can make different decisions um, but uh, it, it, it all comes back to what are your application requirements. Again, if you, if you had a, um, a database or, or an application that required um, zero RPO, um, you would want to pick data centers that were located within 10 millisecond round trip latency such that you could synchronously replicate each of your writes. Um, then you would only be uh, backing up uh, via snapshot your Kubernetes objects. Um, so again, it's, it's all about figuring out, you know, wh what your business requirements are, what your data center architecture, data center topology looks like, and then pick the best DR solution for, uh, for that environment. Um, so with that, I actually want to uh, turn it back over for questions. I'm happy to answer um, any, any questions about kind of, you know, DR in general, anything about Fortworks. Uh, feel free to ask any questions about Rancher. Um, uh, let everybody use the the questions widget within GoToWebinar. Uh, so, a couple of, couple of questions coming in from from the webinar. Uh, can we move workloads from one cluster to another? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, it's um, kind of the well. Let let, let me um, let me caveat by saying that with Portworks, yes, you can. Um, you know, depending on if you know you. I, I think maybe that was the implication of the question, but I just want to, I want to be careful to say with Portworks, yes, you can. What I've dem just demonstrated to you is some capabilities that we call PXDR, uh, which is obviously focused on the disaster recovery use case where it's kind of multi-data center. Uh, but this idea of moving, say, a namespace from one cluster to another within the same data center, uh, the same uh, functionality around moving data and Kubernetes objects um, uh, applies in, in that case, and we call that PX data management. So it's it's essentially this the same primitives, but applied to a different use case. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, the next question is, you know, uh, let's say we have ten versions of backup in case of corruption. Can you select which version to to go back as far as snapshots go? Yep. So you could go back to the latest, or you could go back to any of the subsequent snapshots. Um, each snapshot is going to have a UID that defines it, um, and so you can pick the one that you wanted to go back to. Okay. Now, it, I don't quite understand the question. It says that looks like converting FT part. How about recovering East Edge? I'm guessing just the direction of the recovery. It, I, that's what it sounds like the question's about. Okay, uh, let's, uh, yeah, I don't quite understand it. Um, uh, to whoever asked that, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, after the webinar. I can, I can dig in more, michael at portworks.com. But let's, uh, let's say, you know, my use case is, okay, I, I, I have a primary site. I really want that to be my primary site, but there is a disaster. I fail over to my recovery site. How then do I get all my data back to the primary site after some period of time? Um, the, uh, the cluster pair works both ways. So, at basically as soon as the DR site, or excuse me, as soon as the primary site comes back online, uh, Portworx would, would start moving the data and the objects back to that location. And then when that migration was complete, you can flip over um, and, and run your application out of your, your, your first primary site as well. Okay. Uh, next question. When failover, when failover occurs from west to east, both data and the application are recovered on east. If so, uh, what is running in the front end to divert application traffic? Yeah, that's um, it, that's a good question. It that is up to you. 
Um, so you need some type of load balancer or, or controller in order to A, detect that there's a failure, and then B, um, decide to fail over. Um, we leave that at the um, for the customer to decide simply because you know we're we're a storage and data management company. We don't want to get into kind of networking configuration for your applications, but that would be uh, a decision you would have to make uh, in conjunction with your networking provider. Okay. So a question about licensing uh, licensing pricing. Uh, you can reach out to us. Um, you just go to our website. We can get you a specifics. The reason I'm not going to say it today is because it, it really depends on your environment, like how many licenses you want. Do you want one? Do you want 100? Um, but if you reach out to us, we can get you that information really quickly. All right. Let's see. Does this back up the cluster config and can it be recovered in the same location as well rather than just application applications? Um, uh, could you repeat the question? Sure. Does this back up the cluster config and can it be recovered at the same location rather than uh, just applications? Yeah, so this is, um, I, I think, is this a solution to backing up your etcd database? Um, I think I, that let's uh, frame it that way. Um, it can be. So etcd itself is a stateful service, not unlike, you know, another key value store um, or, or, or a data service. So in that sense, Portworks can provide backup services for that. Um, but because of the circular dependencies, uh, we, we, would, um, we, we will run an etcd cluster for you. But if you have an external etcd cluster powering your Kubernetes database, uh, you would typically manage that kind of as a pet um, to make sure that, like, you know, it services that you're running on that system are dependent on that system. It just creates a circular dependency. That said, if you just wanted to use Portworks to manage an etcd database, uh, we could back it up and we could recover it to the same location. That's similar to the question about, you know, can I back up, can I move applications to another cluster? Um, the, the places where you push those backups is, is up to you. It doesn't have to be a separate data center. Okay, so last question. Can we move workloads from uh, GKE to AKS or any other managed Kubernetes cluster? Yep, ex ex exactly. Um, so th this was focused on the DR use case, which is a special case of what I mentioned as our data management uh, technology, uh, PX, uh, PX data management. So there, it's it's really you can think about PX data management as kind of scheduled and unscheduled maintenance, maintenance operations. So, for instance, um, you know I've, I've got a Kubernetes cluster running in a single data center, and a critical CVE comes out. You know, Rancher discovers um, you know uh, some vulnerability in, um, in in Kubernetes, works with the community, updates it. Now everybody needs to upgrade their their Kubernetes from version X to version Y. Um, if I've got you know uh, hundreds of pods running on a Kubernetes cluster and I want to upgrade in place. I want to stand up a new cluster. Then I want to take all my applications and move them between those environments. That's a perfect use case for uh, PX data management. Uh, if I just um, go back to this slide here, because um, what's going to happen is Portworks essentially will take your data and your application configuration and point it to that new environment. And that could be in the same data center, simply in a se separate cluster. Or, or as the, the person who asked the question, that could be, you know, a GKE cluster and, and my source is in, is in Azure. Um, thanks to the beauty of containers, um, the, the environment dependencies for running those applications are minimal, uh, which means, yes, absolutely, you can move between any of the Kubernetes managed service offerings. Um, you know, we have people that, you know, you know I tried OpenShift and want to, want to try Rancher. So let me move my, uh, my applications between those environments. Absolutely, you can do that. Okay, so one other question came in. How well does Portworx integrate with existing storage clusters, for example, Gluster and Ceph? Uh, yeah, good, qu good question. Um, so all Portworx requires is a, um, a, a really a disk. And so if, uh, and, and we have customers doing this, you know, they have their infrastructure team runs a Ceph cluster and that Ceph cluster <laughs> is behind uh, is what actually provides the storage to their VMware environment. And so when, in, when, it, when, a, v, when a VM is given to uh, the Kubernetes team, it comes with a Ceph volume. Um, 
we can take that Ceph volume and we can uh, virtualize it to provide storage for containerized applications. Uh, so there's no reason to rip and replace um, your application because you know if you already have infrastructure, um, you're an Amazon. You you get an EBS volume. That's fine. You can just use that. Um, you know, NetApp would be the same thing. EMC would be the same thing. Uh, the 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 question you have to ask is not can you know, can Portworx do that? It's rather does the underlying storage system provide the um, the performance and you know um, I don't know really I guess performance is the big one for my application. Meaning, for instance, if you're going to run try to run Cassandra, probably you don't want cluster FS um, as the underlying storage volume for a Cassandra application. One, Cassandra likes local storage. Two, ClusterFS is a file storage system, and so it's just not optimized for databases. Um, could be the, potentially the case with Ceph um, because of the um, uh, Cassandra liking all of its data in a single location, but it's not a technical question of whether or not Portworx can, can consume those volumes. It's just a question of your application requirements. Okay, so follow-up. Uh, if I understand correctly, it can't back up to external volume devices such as a file or tape streamer and restore? Uh, we can back up to an object store. So, um, you know, I, what I, the, the demo here was cluster to cluster and um, either clusters in different data centers uh, in the case of DR, or we talked about you could do clusters within the data center, same data center uh, for maybe kind of a, a fresh install of Kubernetes. Uh, that's all direct cluster to cluster. If you just wanted to back up your application configuration and your data to an object store, you can do that as well. Uh, we, we support any S3 compatible object store. So that means all of the cloud providers, um, you know, if you run a, um, a, an S3 compatible object store on-prem, like a Minio cluster or something like that, uh, we can back up to those environments as well. And the awesome. one reason you might want to do that would be, you know, you want to save on compute. You don't want to, you don't want to have a secondary Kubernetes cluster. Um, you have a require uh, an application that you know it's important, such that you want to have backups, but you don't need to pay for compute um, of a secondary Kubernetes cluster all the time. You just want to have those objects and that data available, such that if you need to pull it down, you can spin up some VMs, install Kubernetes, and, and be good to go there. Um, you know your R RTO will be a little bit longer, but you know that's okay if that's okay with your business requirements. All right, thank you, Michael. That's it for our questions. I'm gonna grab control back. Sure, thank you for giving me the opportunity. This was great. And um, I, I'll, the video that I shared, the video demo and the slides will be available uh, to everybody after the presentation. Awesome, and we'll, def we'll definitely make sure that links and slides and the recording get sent out as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. Right, I'm gonna to to try that out, really, really cool stuff. Thank you. All right, so with that, we have some upcoming classes, the continuation of our Kubernetes Masterclass series um, from a number of individuals, uh, both with Rancher and with, and with different partners. Uh, you can sign up at rancher.com slash Kubernetes-master-class. And with that, thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Michael, so much for your presentation, and we'll see you in the next uh, Masterclass. Thank you, everyone. This was a pleasure. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.